solution. Okay, Doc, give me two on the street. Uh, first, let me take this opportunity to acknowledge all of the elected officials in the House. Uh, but most importantly, I want to acknowledge you and your commitment for coming out tonight and spending this time uh, with us. I'm not going to be before you long, but I'm going to be before you as long as it takes. Now, y'all going to have to read between the lines. <laughs> As uh, Brother Charles said, my name is uh, Dr. Divine Pryor. I'm a criminologist, I'm a researcher, I'm a spokesperson, I'll soon be an author, I'm working on two books at one time, and many other things. I run a center, the only one of its kind, anywhere in the country and anywhere in the world. It's the world's first and the world's only public policy research think tank and academic center that was created and designed by formerly incarcerated professionals representing every discipline from law to medicine. Now in case you don't know what that means, let me, I'm gonna break it down to you a little bit more simply. That means that everybody that is a part of my staff and my faculty are people who hold PhDs but spend time in prison. There are people who were told that they came from nothing and they would never be nothing. There are people who were pushed to the back, who were shoved out and locked out. Those were the people who were denied. I'm gonna tell you a story about a young man who came to school many mornings hungry. Came to school hungry because he came from a family of nine brothers and sisters. And when you come from a family that large, unless you get up very early, you might not get your whole suit. Some of y'all might be able to identify with that. And especially when you're the youngest of the nine, you got to fight your way through. And you also have to get used to wearing hand-me-downs. Meaning after your oldest brother passed it down to the next one, passed it down, by the time you got the shoes, they barely had heels on them, but you had to wear. Y'all don't know about hand-me-downs. <laughs> now, I might be revealing my age. I may not be as young as I look, but I'll tell you that uh, 40 years ago, I used to wear hand-me-downs. And, and I used to sit in a classroom in, in the third grade, which means I wasn't but about eight then. And when your stomach is competing with your brain, it's hard for you to pay attention. See, back then in the 60s, they had not yet quite made the connection between a nutritious meal and your ability to pay attention in class. And so when that wasn't diagnosed, they said that my inability to pay attention was a learning disorder. And they wanted to put me in special ed. But grandma said, no, ain't nothing wrong with that boy. <laughs> and refused to do it. Next thing they didn't recognize is that I was a bright kid. I believe I was bright. At least the scores that we take now say that. They didn't recognize that my intellectual growth was occurring much faster than my physical development could handle. And so when that happens, you get bored because you're not being stimulated, so you do things. And when I did those things, you said, see, not only does he have a learning disorder, but he's disruptive and he's encouraging. And so they started to put me out and put me in detention and eventually on suspension, and then eventually I got kicked into the streets. And when I got to the streets, of course, the streets welcomed me with open arms and said, well, we'll take you. And in fact, they said, we heard that you're a little smart. We want you to figure out how we can get inside this factory. <laughs> and I started smoking cigarettes. And I remember the first day they gave me a cigarette that was a little different than the ones I had been smoking. I said, this is a little different. The guy said, yeah, it's a special one. <laughs> Found out was marijuana. Yeah. Now they are going to call them blunts. Yeah. And that's how I got introduced, but I always had a book in my back pocket. I never forget when one of my friends said, why do you always carry a book in your back pocket? I don't know, to read it? I, 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 you know, but I say all this because I'm setting you up for something. That unless our public school system understands 
that they have more responsibility than they could ever imagine. When you're a teacher, it's not only about the classroom, it's about what's going on at home, what's going on in the community, what's going on on their way to school. A teacher has a major responsibility. And that is the reason why we have to have a daycare system that complements what's happening in the public school system, that complements what's happening in the labor force, that complements what's happening in housing. In other words, this is a collective effort. This is not about one or the other. But see, I say all this because I gotta give you all a little history lesson because see, I told you my center is a unique center which means we're a little controversial. So I gotta maintain my reputation. And my reputation is I'm known to say something controversial, right? So there ain't no need for me to start upsetting that now. So let me tell you what's controversial. What's controversial is what we're all trying to avoid. And that is the issue of race. You know, that's, that's that thing in the middle of the room that everybody knows is there and it's getting bigger and bigger, but nobody wants to discuss it. You see, I think that, you know, one has to raise the question, how is it that the majority of children that are in prison today happen to be the great, great, great grandchildren of former slaves? Why is it coincidental that the individuals that are the last to be hired and the first to be fired happen to be the great, great, great grandchildren of those who were only fully employed during slavery, and once slavery was over, unemployment went through the roof. It just seems to be a coincidence to me. It seems to be a coincidence that today, our prison industrial complex only survives at the fate of our young children. If you go into any prison system in America, go to Ohio, go to Nebraska, go to Wyoming, where you can't find a person that looks like you or I, if your life depended on it, go to the local jail or prison, and that's where you'll find it. This might be a coincidence. It's a coincidence that when the Columbine shooting took place, y'all remember that, it was, a, it was a white youth, came to school with an automatic weapon, killed up many students in the school, and many of them were hurt, including teachers. And the very first thing that happened, they said, oh my God, this should never happen in Columbine. And they were right, it shouldn't happen anywhere. But the next thing they did is says, let's bring in counselors and let's bring in, you know, social workers and psychiatrists because the community must be traumatized, yet it happens in our communities every day and we're still waiting for the social workers. Oh, I didn't even get you had a good part kid. I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm just getting warm. Although I'm only going to be a few more moments and I think y'all get the point. You know, it's this nasty word that we don't want to deal with. This thing, slavery. But you know, I remember reading Harriet Tubman's book. She escaped from slavery. She made 19 trips. She freed over 600 people. Most of them, many of them are family. Harriet Tubman said, I could have freed a whole lot more had they known they were slaves. You see, there's nothing more psychologically damaging than a slave that thinks they're free. And there's nothing uh, more dangerous than a slave who's free and still don't know it. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I think it's important that you know this. You've got to understand this. The American system that we know today, i got to tell you this, was founded on slave labor. This is a fact. America was built with slave labor. When folks that look like you and I were brought to America, we were not brought here on the Nina, the Pinta, or the Santa Maria. We didn't come on Ellis Island. We didn't come here on yachts and boats. We came here in the hold of slave ships for one purpose and one purpose only. Now it's important that you understand this because I'm going to give you a trajectory. So we were property. And you know property can't own property. 
And the first laws on the books, go back to the law books, this ain't Dr. Pryor, this is the books. The first laws in America were the laws about property. It was about how to protect the property, how to sell the property, how to transmit the property, how to insure the property, and guess what? We were the property. Just want you to hold that fact. Now the property had no rights to own property which means that the property couldn't accumulate wealth. And the laws were so sophisticated that the property owner, which was really the slave owner, but I'm being politically correct, the property owner was given rights to own property that didn't even exist at the time that they were given the rights. Meaning that your children's 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 children would be their property even before they were conceived. And you know who I'm talking about? I'm talking about your children because they are the children's 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 children I'm talking about because they're the ones who were the descendants of the slaves and today are caught up in a system that is nothing more than modern day slavery and once they catch them in the system they become what? State property. Meaning you came as property and a very cunning and sophisticated system has found a way to make you state property again. Now I'm gonna close on this note. It's really interesting. We celebrate Abraham Lincoln, and I think he was a nice guy, if you knew him. I didn't know him, but I'm assuming he was a nice guy. But he wasn't so nice that he did not realize that when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation that was supposed to free the slaves, that as soon as the slaves were freed, they created what they call the Black Codes. Y'all may not know what the Black Codes are, but I'm gonna tell you what they are. The Black Codes were laws against slaves attempting to be free. So this is how it was set up. So the Emancipation Proclamation is signed on June 13th, 1863. On June 14th, nobody knew it. It wasn't in fact until a year later because they forgot to send out the memo. But eventually when the memo went out and the slaves realized they were free, the moment they stepped off the plantation, they were breaking the law. Because the first slave law was the vagrancy law. And the vagrant was anybody who was not fully employed and did not have a place of residence. So that means that as soon as you step off the plantation, you break in the law because you're a vagrant. And you were locked up. And then the next law was the convict lease law. And what law was that? The convict lease law was the law that said if you were locked up, you could be leased back to the plantation sometime before the bed even got closed. And then the next law was, oh, this was a good one. It was the literacy test. So, oh yeah, you're free now. But first, before you can vote as a free person, you gotta pass this test. And as soon as you pass the test, you were arrested. The only way you could pass the test is if you knew how to read. It was against the law for a to read. Now I can go on and on, but let me just say this. But I want y'all to know that I, I, I ain't crazy, and I see how this ties into daycare. When you begin to deprive a child of those first years where they're cultivated and nurtured, where they can grow, where they can learn, where they can thrive. Once you begin to stunt their growth, then you begin to align them up so that they become victims of a system designed for their destruction. Once they're unable to think and make critical decisions, they exercise poor judgment, and when they do, they become what? Victims of the system. Once they don't have the ability to be able to distinguish one thing from the other, once they don't have the ability to use their intelligence, that God-given intelligence, once they don't have that and can't use that, they become what? Victims of the system. And once they become victims of the system, they become property of the system, and property has no rights. That's why they lose their right to vote. They lose their right to access housing. They lose their right to adopt children. They lose their rights. This is the reason why. All of this is happening. Now I gotta go. I don't have much more time. I, I'm being given the signal. But I will tell you this. The reason why you won't hear most people speaking to you this way, because it's not politically correct. Well, I'm not politically correct. They messed around and let me go to school and get a couple of letters after my name, you know? And they allowed me to read some books and analyze them. And as a result of that, I said, well, I could just be status quo and go along. I said, but why would I do that, right? I can just buck the system, right? I, I get paid a lot more for being controversial. 
Now, I don't think that what I'm saying is controversial at all because, in fact, none of what I said is disputable. Anything that I've said tonight, you can go and check it out. Go to, go to your computer and type in Google, type in the slave codes, type in the black codes, type in the Emancipation Proclamation, type in the prison industrial complex, and what you're going to find is a very sophisticated system that was designed to maintain oppression. That means oppressed people. But there's good news. And this was Sunday, I could take this somewhere else, but this ain't Sunday. But if y'all come to Greater Works, which is 9624 Van Wick Expressway, I'm there every Sunday, service starts at 9.30. Just figured I'd put that plug in. Figured I'd put that in. There is good news, and that is that the fact that we are here today is proof of our longevity. It's proof that we have that stick to -itiveness. It's proof that we have whatever it takes for us to overcome, because we've overcome every ism you can think of, every form of racism, sexism, this ism, that ism. We're here, and the only thing been here longer than us is roaches. And so. I'm going to close by saying this. It's time for us to stand up. Yes. And it's time for us to stand up because when you're standing up straight, it's hard for somebody to ride your back. You know, Brother Martin Luther King said that he would rather, he would rather die on his feet than to live on his knees. Yes. And I'm telling you that I heard that anybody who has to stand for something will go for anything. And so I want you to know, in the words of Brother El Haj Malik El Shabazz, and he said this after he had demonstrated to us that we are an extraordinary people, that we are, we are the descendants of kings and queens, that we are royalty, that we are mighty, we are intelligent, we are bright, we are profound, we are brave, we are courageous, we are the recipients of a legacy. So he said that we as a people have done so much for so long with so little that we are now qualified to do anything with nothing. I say people always shoot for the moon because even if you miss, you'll still be amongst the stars. Thank you so much. <laughs>